Thanks, Karen. Good to see you. Second service, man. I want to welcome those of you on our live stream with us here today. It's great to see you guys. I wish I had time to go out there and shake everybody's hand and give you a hug and say thanks for being here, man. Lift up Jesus in this place. In the service today, Nellie Guerrero, I mentioned this last uh, Sunday, but Nellie's retiring. She's our preschool uh, director here at Paul Ann, been here for a long time. I think between here and Head Start, she served about 30 years in children's ministry here in San Angelo. Anyway, he's, she's going to retire. Right at the end of my serv- sermon today, I'm going to bring her up here and uh, honor her, and she's going to retire. And we've got a reception for her out in our commons as you leave out there. So I want to just give you a heads up on that. I want to preach a little bit on hope today. We kind of live in a challenging time, lots of crazy things going on. And from time to time, sometimes difficulty come to all our lives right? Problems arise, sometimes unexpected, come into our lives. And uh, the question is, how do we respond to those things? I can often remember thinking when I was younger, can't wait till I get a little bit older and my life gets a little more simpler, right? And I don't have near as many difficulties. But what I found out is life's complicated all the time. And there's always something going on in your life that's difficult. I heard a guy in seminary one time, he was preaching on that passage of scripture where uh, the disciples were in the boat with Jesus and Jesus was asleep. This huge storm comes up, and they all think they're about to die, and they're, they're up there waking up Jesus. Wake up, Jesus. Don't you care that we're about to perish? Anyway, he said this, man. In life, you'll find out that you're either in a storm, going into a storm, or coming out of a storm. Life has a tendency to be one storm after another. So I want to just give you a little hope today and look how, as believers, should we respond when we go through a difficult time or a problem comes into our life that seems to be bigger than what we can handle How do we deal with that particular situation? I want to do it from Joshua chapter 5. So if you have your Bible, open it up to Joshua chapter 5, Old Testament, old school, Joshua chapter 5. Joshua, uh, the word Joshua actually means Jehovah saves or Jehovah is salvation. It's the Hebrew equivalent of the name of Jesus, all right? Jehovah saves and um, Uh, Joshua took over from Moses. Moses was the leader of the nation of Israel. He had come out uh, by, by, Joshua was a type of Christ, whereas Moses represented the law. The law was given to Moses, right? And he had brought the nation of Israel right to the edge of the promised land, but it was Joshua who was going to take them in because the same thing goes for us. The law can get us to the edge of the promised land, but only Jesus can actually take us in. So by the time you get to uh, Joshua chapter five, they're in the promised land, and they're facing the city of Jericho. The scripture begins like this. This is chapter 5, verse 13. When Joshua was near Jericho, so Jericho is a city, great oasis, one of the oldest cities in the world. There's a big oasis right there. It's called City of the Palms. And uh, basically, you could cross the Jordan River, and right where you came into the promised land, it was kind of the gateway city. To, To get into the promised land, you had to go through Jericho. And it was a walled city. They estimate the walls were maybe 20 foot tall, 20 foot thick, about 25 foot tall. So everybody knew, man, you couldn't take the promised land until you first took Jericho. And that was kind of Joshua's problem. So he went out and was near Jericho and he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua approached him and said, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, I have now come as commander of the Lord's army. Then Joshua bowed with his face to the ground in worship and asked him, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? What does my Lord want to say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, remove the sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy So Joshua did that. The same exact thing that was said to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. Take off your sandals for the place where you stand is holy ground. Happened to Joshua, and Joshua did that. Now, Joshua, like I said, has taken over from Moses, and he has led the nation of Israel into the promised land. God had told him that everywhere you set the sole of your feet, I will give to you. Joshua 1-3, I've given you every place where the sole of your feet treads just as I promised Moses. So Joshua was in charge of, some people estimate, as many as 2 million people. Sounds like a headache to me. 2 million people he's in charge of, men, women, and children. They've crossed the Jordan River into the promised land, but uh, Joshua's got a problem, and the problem is Jericho. 
It's this massive walled city in front of him. They've never seen a walled city. They don't know how to combat it. They don't know how to attack it. They don't know what to do with it. And really his prosperity uh, has actually kind of hindered him because it wasn't just like Joshua was there by himself. It wasn't like Joshua was there with his army. No, his family is there. His kids are there. His wife is there. It's, he's got two million men, women, and children he's trying to take care of. And here's this huge walled city. It's like the enemy had a stronghold that they could perhaps come out of and attack him and their children and then go back into this walled city and, 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 and receive protection. And right behind him was a Jordan River, which was a flood stage. So in front of him was a walled city. Behind him was a flooded river. And God had dried it up so they could go in. But God hadn't said anything about going out. And so I think Joshua was a little bit stressed. You ever get a little bit stressed? You ever have a problem in your life that you can't seem to fix? You ever wake up in the middle of the night worrying about something that you don't know how to deal with it? Wake up early in the morning worrying about something because you're stressed, you have a difficulty in your life and you don't know how to fix it. I I normally sleep really good, but I can remember a month or so back, I had something on my mind that was so stressing me out. I woke up really early in the morning. It was the very first thing I thought about. Ever get a little stressed? This is Joshua. He's stressed out because he doesn't know how to conquer Jericho. He's never had to face this particular problem before. He doesn't have the expertise to do it. So he goes out in the morning to take a look at it, perhaps, or the middle of the day. It says when Joshua was near Jericho, so he left to go over near Jericho, and he looked up, and he saw a man standing in front of him with a a drawn sword. So he goes over to take a look at Jericho, which was his problem, and then the Scripture says he looked up. ESV translated, he lifted up his eyes. In other words, he took his eyes off of his problem and he looked up. And when he looked up, he saw a man standing there with a drawn sword. Now, God has promised to send us a deliverer in the future that's going to be a man. He said in the book of Exodus, he would send us a man that was like Moses. A prophet would come one day that would be a deliverer of Israel. Genesis 3.15 says one day God's going to send a man who's going to be the seed of woman. And he's going to actually strike Satan on the head and destroy him. But he will heal be who... Uh, bruised in the process that one day God's going to send us a man. He looks up and he sees a man standing there with a sword drawn. So Joshua approaches him, Scripture says, perhaps with his hand on his sword as well. And he asks him in verse 13, chapter 5, are you for us or are you for our enemies? Literally, he said, are you for us or are you against us? Kind of get this picture in your mind. Here's this man with a drawn sword out and Joshua comes up and says, hey, man, literally in the Hebrew, are you for us or against us? Are you for me or against me? And the the man says, neither. I'm the commander of the Lord's army, and I have now come. You you ever had one of those situations when you were young and you were going to play a sport, you're going to play a game of basketball or, you know, a little flag football or touch football or baseball, and so you pick two, two captains, and you're just like, you guys pick the teams. And so one would pick and the other one would pick. And, and uh, I don't know if this ever happened to you, but I was always standing out there going, Lord, please, let me not be the last one picked, <laughs> right? I don't have to be the first. Just let me get picked somewhere in the middle. And uh, I just want to be on one side or the other, you know. Or, or sometimes one team would start getting stacked. Like they, you knew their talent and you're playing some basketball and that guy's good and that guy's good and that was a really bad pick and I really want to be on this side because I think this is going to be the winning side. Whose side are you on? Is what uh, Joshua wanted to know. Whose side are you on? And this guy just says neither. I'm on neither side, but the commander of the Lord's army has now come. Now, I want to show you why this passage is so relevant to us because When we have a problem in our lives, normally the way we try to attempt to deal with a problem, no matter what it is, is we come up with a plan, right? So if you've got financial problems, you know, you're like, I got to have a plan. I I need a raise. I need to ask for a raise, or I'm going to have to get a second job, or I'm going to have to cut expenses, or I'm going to have to rob a bank, or, you know, we want to come up with a plan, right? Like if you're having a health issue that comes up unexpectedly, you're like, I'm going to go to the doctor, or I'm going to get a better doctor. I'm going to get a different doctor. I'm going to take some medicine. I'm going to take some different medicine. I'm going to have surgery. We come up with a plan. If you have marriage difficulties, you come up with a plan. I'm going to 
I'm going to get some counseling. I'm going to go get some help. If you have a problem with your kids, problems with school, you got something going on, school, I'm going to study harder. I got to do better. I'm not. We always come up with a plan. And then if you're a believer, we ask God to bless our plan. Okay, here's my plan, God. Now, God, would you come along and bless my plan? Really, we, what we do is we come up with a plan and we say to God the same thing Joshua said, hey, are you for me or against me? Because if you're for me, you're going to help my plan succeed. God, would you help me with my plan? And, and the problem with that is, you know, it's still our plan. It's like, I got the plan, God. I need you to come help me. And what we do is we take the God of the universe and boil him down to a genie in a bottle. And we're just like, hey, God, come out and help my plan succeed. You've got the plan. How do you even know if it's God's plan? It's your plan. You're just asking God to help you accomplish what you want to accomplish. Now, I I just want you to know, man, uh, this is the way I do it. Just to be honest, if I've got a problem, I come up with a plan, and then I go to work on the plan. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to stay up later. I'm going to do more. I'm going to make that plan work, and I'm going to pray, God, help me make my plan work. Like we're looking for a spiritual formations pastor. We need a guy to come in and help us with our small groups, discipleship, assimilate people, you know, just brand new believers, help them get us equipped. In a, we need a guy. So, you know, we got a plan. It's like, okay, we're going to come up with a job description. We're going to tell everybody we know. We're going to post it. We're going to call everybody we know, ask them to apply. We're going to do interviews, and we're going to find out. Uh, we're going to find a guy. God, help us find our guy, right? What, ev- what if that's not even the right plan? This guy says, I'm not on either side, right? I'm not on either side. I'm just a commander of the Lord's army. It's not like I'm on either side. The question is, are you on my side? In other words, what God says is, you know, when it comes to God in this particular passage of Scripture, it's not the plan that matters. It's the person, right? And what God wants us to see, God wants us to see him in his position. His position is better than any plan that we might come up with. God's trying to get us to see a person because if you can see the right person, when this guy said, I'm the commander of the Lord's army, that was all that Joshua needed, the person, right? So you just look at this particular passage of Scripture when the commander of the Lord's army showed up. We don't really know who he is. Maybe Joshua's out there, if you can just picture this. Maybe he's out there looking at Jericho. He's sitting there on top of the hill looking at it going, God, that thing is huge. You know what I really need? I need like a battering ram. If I had a battering ram, I think I could knock those gates down. Or he's up there going, you know, I don't know if they've invented a catapult yet, but a catapult would be good. I got to launch some boulders inside of there. Or maybe he's thinking about ladders. Or maybe he's thinking about scaling hooks. Or maybe he's thinking about a drone. If we just had a drone, I could find out what's going on in the inside of there. But God doesn't God God doesn't do any of that. What God does is sends him a person, a man standing there with a sword drawn, the commander of the Lord's army. Now, we don't know who this guy is. Some scholars believe he was what's called a theophany, which means God. Theo means God. Ophany means in the flesh. It's a theophany. This is God in the flesh. Yahweh showed up in the flesh as a warrior with a sword in his hand, ready to do battle, the commander of the Lord's army. And you'll see that in chapter 6, verse 2, where, where Joshua refers to him as Lord, Yahweh. So it could have been Yahweh in the flesh. Some people believe it's a Christophany, which that means Jesus Christ in the flesh, right? Pre-incarnate showing up as the commander of the Lord's army. It could have been an angel, all right? Here's the deal. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. I, any one of them could have got the job done. I mean, it tells us in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35, an angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. Isn't it funny sometimes when we get in a problem, we can look at our lives as believers, and we can look back on our life, and we can see how God was faithful to us in our past. Like, like we can look back and say, well, you know, God took care of me here, and God provided for me here, and God blessed me here. I'm just not sure he's going to do it this time. I mean, I know, God, you did it here. I know you took care of me there. I know you did it over there, but I'm just not sure you can do it. It's almost like Joshua's up there. Joshua was with Moses from the very get-go 
I mean, he saw, he was there when the 10 plagues hit in Egypt. He saw the angel of death come through on the first Passover. He was there when they parted the Red Sea. He saw the manna from heaven. He saw the water from a rock. He saw the, Red, the, the, the Jordan River get parted. And he goes over on dry land. And now he's up there stressing out. Well, God, I know you did all that. Just not sure you can take down Jericho. Right? It wouldn't have mattered which one it was, whether it was God in the flesh, I mean, Jesus in the flesh, pretty much the same thing, or an angel. Any one of them could, could take them, take it out. It, you know, just for us to look at that, it's, it's, it's not about our plan. It's about a person. And if you got the right person, he's going to take care of your problem. So for everybody in this room who's got a problem, you know what I want to encourage you to do today is just lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes off your problem and put it on a person because if you have the person, the right person, the commander of the Lord's army, he'll take care of the situation for you. Here's Joshua. He lifts up his eyes. The guy says, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. Whose side are you on? It doesn't matter which side he's on. The, the, what matters are you on his side. And when Joshua sees that, he falls down on the ground, bows down in worship and says to him, right, my Lord, what, do, what does my Lord want to say to his servant? This is what we've got to do. We've got to lift our eyes and put it on God. And then when we see that, we fall face down before him. And we say, my Lord, what do you want to say to your servant? The question is, can you say that? Because our problem is we like to run our plans. Can you actually get to the point where you're willing to recognize Jesus Christ as Lord of your life? I'm not just talking about getting saved. I'm talking about you right now been able to say, why don't you do it, God, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. What you really don't need is a plan. What you really need is a person. And once he got the person, once he submits to that person, then he gets the plan. But, but until you submit to the person, you're not going to want to do his plan because God's plans are always crazy. Right? I mean, his ways are not our ways. I mean, you ever look at the plan he told him to conquer Jericho? If he'd have told him that plan at the get-go, he was like, I think I'll come up with my own plan because I don't like that plan. But, he, but, but because he'd surrendered to the leader, he was willing to follow his plan. First, it's the person, then God gives you the plan. So you can look at this particular passage of Scripture. He bows down. He surrenders. Once he surrenders to the person, what do you want to say? Then he gets the plan. Take off your shoes because you stand on holy ground. He takes off his sandals because he's on holy ground. Any place where God is, is holy. If you're a believer in Jesus, you need to be living like it. And then we get chapter 6, verse 1. Jericho was strongly fortified because of the Israelites. Not one was leaving or entering. That little scripture right there, you ought to just put little brackets around it. It's just in there to say what the problem was. The problem was... Ain't nobody leaving Jericho, and nobody could get in because it was a fortified city. There was no way for Israel to get in that city and defeat the people that were inside of it. That was the problem. The commander of the Lord shows up. Joshua says, tell me what to do. I'll do it. He says, take off your, feet, your, your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. And then the Lord said, verse 2, he just continues the sentence. Yahweh says to Joshua, look, I've handed Jericho, its king and its best soldiers, over to you. It's already a done deal, God says. I've already done it. I've already paid the price. It's already a done deal. Here's all I need you to do. Verse 3, march around the city with all the men of war circling the city one time. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry seven ram's horn trumpets in front of the ark, the ark of the covenant. But on the seventh day, march around the city seven times while the priests blow the trumpets when there is a prolonged blast of the horn and you hear it sound, have all the troops give a, mount, a mighty shout, and then the city walls will collapse and the troops will advance straight ahead. If you're Joshua, you'll be like, that's the plan. But he's willing to follow the plan. You know why? Because he's met the person. And if you look at that particular, you read the rest of the story, you say, what's the, what's the point of that particular plan? Here's the point of the plan. It's to highlight the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is used nine times in 12 verses, that word, the Ark. And the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God. It was a box that God told Moses to build. On top of it was a seat, a mercy seat. It was called the mercy seat. It had two angels. 
See, the plan of God is that he might dwell with his people, but God can't dwell with his people because we're sinful, and if that much holiness gets close to us, it kills us. And so God, God can't dwell with his people, but he, he provided a way for himself to dwell with his people. The sacrificial system, he said, if you'll take a lamb and kill it, I'll, you, I'll view that as a temporary covering for your sin so I can come into your presence. Take some of the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, the propitiation seat. Inside the box was the law, Above it was God, in between was the mercy seat. Put some of the blood on the mercy seat and I'll show mercy and I'll come dwell with you, the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God over the Ark of the Covenant. He says, take the Ark, put soldiers in front of it, put soldiers around it and march that thing around the city six days in a row. On the seventh day, march around seven times and give a, a trumpet blast. Where's the victory gonna come from? No mention of the people. It's all, all, it's all about the presence of God. And here's the wheel, because once you know the person, then you get the presence. And once you have the presence, the presence gives you the power to overcome your enemies. Once you know the person, you get the presence. And once you have the presence, it gives you the power to overcome your enemies. You give your life to Jesus Christ, the presence of God and the Holy Spirit, the form of the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of you. The question is, are you able to lift up your eyes and bow down before the commander of the Lord's army and surrender your life to him? Because once you know the person, you get the presence, and once you have the presence, then you get the power to overcome your problems. Now, I'd like to encourage you today to trust in the person. Well, you might say, well, if I'm like Joshua and I see the commander of the Lord's army standing in front of him with a sword drawn, it'd be easy to bow down before him and surrender my life to him. We're not going to get that, but I would like to paint just a little bit of a picture of the commander of the army of the Lord today so that you might see him in a clearer light, right? So like we look at our lives, if we want to just boil it all down, everybody in this room has a problem. Everybody in this world has a problem, and the problem is we're all sinners. Every problem you have either hinges from the fact that you're a sinner and you did something stupid, which sin makes you stupid. You did something you shouldn't do, or somebody else did something stupid, and you're being affected by it. All the problems in the world come down to our sin nature. We want to do what we want to do, and people are in conflict over that, whether it's your marriage problems or financial problems, or we got war in Ukraine because somebody wants something, and they think they ought to be able to have it, and they're going to take it from somebody else. It's just sin. Sin's the problem, and we have no power to overcome it. We're actually in bondage to sin. You can't stop sinning. It's part of your sin nature, and the wages of your sin is death. It's, a, it's, it's the issue. It's bigger than what you can take. It's your Jericho. But because God loves us enough, he sent somebody to deal with that. He sent a man. And this man was born as a baby in a manger. But he grew up to be a man. And he showed up one day when he was 30 years old. And he made this proclamation, behold, the kingdom of heaven is near. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Why was the kingdom of heaven near all at that once? Because the king had come. And because the king had come, the kingdom of God was near. And Jesus went out and was baptized. And when Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water, a voice from heaven. God himself said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and rested upon Jesus, the very presence of God, to empower him to his task immediately. It says in the book of Matthew, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The very first thing Jesus did was he had to go to war, had to go to battle with the devil because the devil controlled the world. And the very first temptation was, man, he, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. He got there by himself and the devil says to him, man, you're the son of God and you're hungry? What kind of God do you serve? You're the son of God and you're hungry. Why don't you turn this stone into bread and eat that? Aren't you hungry? Why don't you, here's the temptation, use your own power for your own good. Why don't you come up with your own plan? Why are you following God's plan for? Why don't you come up with your own plan? Why don't you use your power to serve yourself? But Jesus responds with the word of God. The word of God says man is not lived by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God defeats him with scripture. Three times he's tempted. The last temptation, he takes him up on top of a hill and shows him all the, the, the devil shows him everything in the world, all the kingdoms of the world in a glance. And he says, I'll give all these to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Oh, but Jesus didn't get to bow down and worship him. Why? Because scripture says, and he quotes it, you shall have no other God before me. Right? You don't, I'm, you're not supposed to worship anybody but God alone. And in those three times that he used scripture, he defeats 
Satan in the first battle. Now, the question is, what is Scripture referred to in the New Testament? Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 tells us, uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It says in Hebrews chapter 4, 12, for the Word of God is living and active, active and sharper than any two-edged sword. The Word of God is the sword. God sent us a man with a sword in his hand to go do battle for us, the commander of the Lord's army. After the temptation, Satan left him for a more opportune time. That more opportune time came in the Garden of Vicinity, vicinity the night before Jesus was crucified, when all the sin of mankind was being placed upon Jesus. And there in the garden, Satan tempts him to skip out on God's plan and to do it his way. And even Jesus said, God, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, would you let it pass from me? But then almost like Joshua, it's like he bows down and says, but what does my Lord want to say to me? And then Jesus says, but not my will be done, but Yours And Jesus goes to the cross and the judgment of the sin of mankind falls upon Jesus. The the sword, in a sense, falls upon him, not because he deserved it, but he did it for us. And on the cross, he dies. It's a crazy plan. And on the cross, he dies to pay the penalty for our sin, even though he didn't deserve it. And the devil thinks he's won, but three days later... God raises him to newness of life, resurrection from the dead. And the moment Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, in that moment, the great commander of the Lord's army defeated sin, death, hell, and the devil all at one time in one place and gave the victory to us, right? This is who we serve. This is the God we serve. He's a warrior king. He's a warrior God. He came and did battle for us to defeat sin, death, and hell. And one day, right now, he's at the right hand of God the Father in all his power. And one day, he's coming back. And when he comes back, they're going to present the title deed to the earth that's going to be presented. Nobody is able to open it except the lamb that was slain, Jesus. He's going to take that title deed, says in the book of Revelations, and he begin to open the seals. Seven seals on it. He's going to open all seven seals. And when he gets down to the seventh seal, all at once, we're going to have trumpets. You know how many trumpets we got? Oh, we're going to have seven trumpets. And they're going to begin to blow one at a time. It's the wrath of God, the judgment of God upon this earth on which we live, upon the sin and all the evil on this earth. And it's going to be one trumpet, two, three, four, five. And when the seventh trumpet blows, all at once the walls of this world, of this Babylon and all its system and all its evil and all its hurt and all its pain and all its sin are going to come crashing down to the ground, be cast into the pit of fire, and God's going to do a new heaven and a new earth when none of that stuff existed. And if you're a follower of the king, you get to be a part of the kingdom. And if you're a believer in Jesus today, you're already in. The battle's already been fought. The battle's already been won. You're a part of the kingdom of God. And if you got difficulties in your life today, problems, which I know you do, I know you got hardships, heartaches, different things going on, and what God has say to you, man, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes off your problem. Put them on your coming, conquering king. And when you see him for what he's done for you, your response is to bow down before him and recognize it's not about your plan. It's about who he is as a person. And if you can just say to him, my Lord, what do you have to say to your servant? Because the battle has already been won for you. He's going to see you through it all the way to the end. In this world, we will have tribulation, but take heart. He has overcome the world. If you're trusting in Jesus today, man, you're on the winning side. The battle actually belongs to him. We do what he wants to do. He's going to give us a victory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for our warrior king who was willing to go all the way to the cross for us. When we wonder if God's for us, well, all we have to do is look at the cross. Help us to lift our eyes even today to believe and to see that you are working in ways that we cannot see, that perhaps some of the difficulties that come our way are there to help us lift our eyes to see our king. Because if we can see our king, man, that's the goal. And he'll work our problems out for his glory.
for us one day. Father, we give you glory for that. We, we, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to uh, uh, encourage you. I want to give you some hope. If that's you, you're going through a hard time, man. God sees you. God knows what you're going through. Lift your eyes, put them on him. He's going to see you through. I'm going to ask Nellie to come up here on stage with me. I think she's in the room here somewhere. Miss Nellie, come on up here, Nellie. I want to present Nellie with some things. All right. So if, I don't know if you know Nellie or if you don't, you should. And if you've got kids, she's probably taking care of them, all right? She took care of mine and my grandkids. And, and uh, this is Miss Nellie. And we got a couple of things, a couple of gifts we're going to give her just to acknowledge her service here at Paul Ann. And, and the first one is a picture of, uh, it's kind of a picture of our staff and elders. We took this at our Christmas party this past year. So it's kind of a, uh, just a picture of our whole staff and elders. And then I had all the staff sign it on the back and... Uh, they wrote, asked them to write one word which described Nellie for them, one word they thought would best describe Nellie. So uh, I just want to read some of them to you. And, and some of them, typical, you know, they're kind of wordy. They're pastors. They wrote more than one. But most of them were uh, kind of followed orders. But um, uh, sharing, nurturing, world shaper, servant, passionate, bold, wise, fierce, Caring, intentional, dedicated. Somebody wrote, you were hot. I hope that's Ray. That <laughs> I, th I think it was Nick, but he's leaving too, so. <laughs> I it kind of messed it up. Oh, he's here, right? Discipler, gracious, kind, friend, dedicated, mentor, a woman after God's own heart, persistent, blessing, genuine, loving, unbending, passionate, faithful, amazing, mentor, dedicated, caring, uh, all words that describe you, Nellie. And uh, you have been so persistent and faithful and, and loving and to uh, kids. And uh, I told the first service, I, I've got a guy working in my house that's uh, uh, putting some tile in. And he was sharing with me that his dad was a pastor. And his dad actually worked with Nellie's dad that was a pastor. And Nellie taught him in children's ministry all the way back. Must have been when you were a teenager, all the way back to uh, being able to take care. But she's been taking care of children her whole life. So just a few words that describe you. I want to give that to you as a gift and say thank you for your service at Paul Ann. And uh, one other gift uh, we want to give you, and this just is a gift from the church, um, uh, just a letter that uh, was written and uh, says, congratulations on your retirement and on a ministry well done. Uh, we will never know this side of heaven how many children and young people you touch with your ministry, heart, and encouraging words. It has been an honor serving with you, and I'm blessed to be able to be your pastor. As a retirement gift, Paul Ann Church wanted to give you something that would be a blessing to you as well and as an encouragement. With that in mind, um, you know, if, if you know Nellie, she has a granddaughter and a son-in-law grandson that are full-time missionaries in the Middle East. You know, with that in mind, we were giving you two round-trip airline tickets for you and ready to go visit them in Abu Dhabi. So that will be a blessing to you. Um, I just want to say thank you, and it's been an honor to serve right alongside, to love your children, to point to some of our families, and uh, just I'm going to keep serving God and sharing the gospel wherever I can. Uh, one thing that they forgot to write on the plaque is stubborn. <laughs> I think a lot of those <laughs> words kind of were a polite way, but really thank you. The bottom of my heart. Yeah. Well, Nellie, we want to thank you. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> I 
Well, Miss, Miss Nelly could make me cry. She's going to slip out. I've asked her to go ahead and right outside on the way out of here, we've got a place set up where if you want to go by and, and stop and talk to her, you can. We've got cards that are all on the tables out there. You'll see them if you go out there. If you want to just stop on your way out and write her a note and just tell you how much you appreciate her. Uh, she'll be around. You can catch her. But her and Ray, she's been a faithful servant to the Lord, man. It's been an honor to serve with her. So I'm going to say a, a word of blessing, and then we'll, uh, you guys will be dismissed. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for everybody that showed up today, God, that showed up to worship you, Father. Help us to lift our eyes, put them on you. Thank you for Nellie and her ministry. And God, thank you for preparing Ty for, uh, to replace her. Thank you for putting that up on Nellie's heart, God. Pray a blessing upon her and Ray and her family. Thank you for everybody that came today, a blessing upon them as well. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you guys for coming today, second service. Be blessed in the name of Jesus, man. I'll see you all next Sunday.